I think he was probably 14 or 15 when he first tried. I had called 911 and I hung myself. I didn't want anybody to find my body. I guess like any any other parent, I just never thought this would happen to me. I just felt like it had conquered me, like I couldn't, I couldn't beat it. At the time, did we think he was into the heavier drugs? No, we didn't. They, they, they look different. They speak different. It's, it's a, it's a drug that um, steals their soul. I was just so unprepared. I just had, I just thought, I really believed that if I kind of did what I needed to do as a mom and look af looked after them well and gave them, you know, opportunities and, and loved them well, that it just wouldn't t touch us. I don't know why I thought it wouldn't touch us. You know, I had three Harleys at one time. I had a quad sled. Um, brand new truck like I had everything in my house and I just I knew that that wasn't me being physically addicted to something. I know that she didn't use opioids like fentanyl and that sort of thing like a lot like I actually have I don't know if she ever did before the time that she passed away. 29 years old successful business owner um, coached hockey for nine years, married three kids, mortgage free in a beautiful home, and I got um, an injury at work. All sorts of stories of, you know, I just tried it a few times and it was a good party drug, and now I'm, I'm hooked to, you know, they were using pain medication legally, and this is, they haven't been able to kind of stop using it. Grand Prairie is a reflection of what we're seeing across the province. Uh, right now in Alberta, approximately two people are dying per day, uh, province-wide. And of the opioid-related deaths in Alberta, 83% of those take place in Alberta's major cities, of which Grand Prairie is one, obviously. And there was a point last year in 2017 where Grand Prairie uh, had the highest rate of opioid deaths per 100,000 people in the entire province. You know, we consider that in our first year of operation, still kind of our first season. Uh, that was one overdose. The, the next year or next season it was uh, six and we're coming up on a 11 month period where we've responded to 44 as uh, staff and volunteers with the St. Lawrence Centre. Probably in the last three to five years it's become predominant and probably one of our, our most uh, common calls that we go on. Uh, before that we would go on an overdose maybe be, maybe once every six months, maybe a year and now it's uh, sometimes it's once a day, twice a day uh, per station. So become quite a crisis and quite uh, quite an epidemic and quite a problem like opioid use along with with everything it, it's all it's all so unique and it's so complex and it's so individual I started doing it started with perks and oxys and things like that I guess long before the heroin weed was the thing that I was trying to address it it used to be a big deal in my world I used to think oh my god you know, I can't believe this is happening, and if that was my only problem now, boy, it would just be so simple. But I didn't really know that it was um, out of control until probably he was 16, I think, when it was really out of control. It turns out that I had um, cracked a couple vertebrates and I wrecked some discs in my back, and I put off painkillers for just about a year, fear and addiction, until basically I got to the point where I couldn't walk upstairs. I had to drag myself with my elbows. Um, I couldn't stand up straight anymore, and I gave in to the doctor's orders. Just take this, you'll feel better. And the first two Percocets that I had ever taken, I could remember my exact thoughts like they're right now, and this could be the beginning of the end of my life. That's the power it had over me. To the average person, they're not going to understand addiction. Like even I have parents who will say to me, well, why can't they just quit? Why can't my son just quit and go back to work? And it's just so difficult for somebody who has an addiction just to pack up and go back to work. It just don't work that way. How some describe it is the best, warmest hug you've ever had. People want that all over again, but the, they need more to get there. Addiction is powerful. It doesn't really matter. It, 
opiates are a special drug all of their own, but all all addiction is it's a chronic disease and it's it's very hard to work with. It's hard for a teenager to believe that they just have to use once and can be addicted. But because of the strength of fentanyl, you're addicted to it just being exposed to it like one, two, by three times you're definitely attached to it. The dope's getting stronger, like the heroin's getting stronger, the opiates are getting stronger. Fentanyl's in everything and it's scary. It's in the pot, it's in the crack, it's in the heroin, it's in the crystal meth, it's in everything. Because it makes it more addictive. Fentanyl makes it more addictive. Shit stain, um, I've heard things, bums, losers, um, useless pieces of shit, um, let's just mow down the park side and these people should die, these people should just be mowed out of here. You don't deserve to live here, you're an addict. Just go die on the street, you don't do that. Why would I do that to somebody else's child? I haven't met one person that doesn't want to feel valued in their life by someone. And for me, that's important to give that to the, every individual who's accessing services here. We're humans and these people need connection. I don't care who you are. We are all human beings and we all deserve to be respected. Individuals who use drugs but are also homeless, they can't hide their drug use. They're generally more uh, vulnerable because of the people who would sell them their drugs. Whereas if you're gainfully employed, married with kids, and like to party on the weekend, you don't have to deal with some of the drug culture that you, know, you have to deal with downtown. So yeah, there's kind of that double whammy of stigma and struggle. Uh, now it's a little bit of chicken and egg. Uh, you know, uh, drug use is a predicating factor in people being homeless, uh, but sometimes people don't try drugs until they are homeless and have to deal with the realities of street life. There's a lot of people out here who had beautiful jobs, awesome careers, um, and fell on hard times, and now they're homeless and living on the streets of Grand Prairie and they're addicted to drugs. And they had the house, the car, the marriage, the children. They had all of that and it's gone because of a car accident. And the doctor prescribed them pills and now they're addicted to the pills. This problem, this, this disease, it affects all walks of life across the board. But I think in the community, it's a lack of education around um, addictions and mental health. And there's still that stigma, whether it's getting better but there, it's still there. And we need to address that more. And then I think people would be more compassionate to, to support people that are struggling. One of the biggest things with opiate use is that when you're in withdrawal, you're incredibly sick, incredibly sick. Vomiting, diarrhea, um, hallucinations sometimes. It affects everybody differently, but they're all bad. The inside of their bones hurt. They um, can't sleep, but yet they don't want to get up. If, you know, most people describe it as though they'd rather be dead than to go through it. And, you know, after I do a pill, it was within four hours, I'd start to get dope sick, right? And within eight, I'd be bedridden. I wouldn't be able to do anything. And it's weird, because you can be so dope sick, but as soon as you're there waiting and you see that car pull up, you're instantly, it's like you're not. Because you know that you're going to be, hot, like, you're going to get that fix any second now. For a long time, it was, I couldn't go anywhere without a big bag of heroin, because I couldn't go into withdrawal. And the ton of pain, like, you're, my, my body hurt. Lots of people get restless legs. I got restless arms, and I was, I'd, like, walk around my house flailing my arms, throwing punches at nothing, just... You just, your muscles just hurt, like hurt, have this feeling like you need to move them and flex them, and but it hurts to move, like. For a lot of our clients, they are very fearful of that withdrawal, and so they will do things that they would not, maybe their values don't want them to do, but they will do anyway because they will do anything to avoid the pain of the withdrawal. And then once she got on the street, she had no choice, she had to live, she had to survive. So you just do what everyone's doing. You know, you, what, I don't know what she did. She won't talk to me about it. She's, she has told me that she, she can't tell me. He beat me up, he did lots of hurtful things. Um, and I 
was angry with him and I guess I kind of, the love that I had for him was still there, but I couldn't love him as he was. Six years later, fast forward, broken marriage, hurt family, hurt friends, supporting a $7,000 a day habit for crystal meth and heroin, IV user on the streets of Calgary. That's what happened in the course of six years and a lot of pain in between. The worst day is walking into a room and finding somebody that we love, we've tried to support and we've done everything we can to support and finding them in their room dead. Yeah. In this community over the last year, we've buried so many people. So many, way too many to count. That's the reality of it. That's the reality of this disease is it takes lives and there's too much. One death is too many. One is too many. You don't feel the overdose. Yeah, you, when you're on an odd, you feel like you're just going to sleep, that's it. And, but you don't wake up. You don't know you're overdosing or nothing. Like I said, it's like that game, that style of drug is like Russian roulette. You don't know if you're going to live or die the next tattoo, the next dude, or the next poke. Or... The last time that he overdosed, AJ found him, and it was he was supposed to come hang out with us the night before. I seen him the night before, and we were, we were partying at my house. Um, and I seen him drive by, I stopped him, and he was like, yeah, I'm just going to grab some shit and I'll be back. And he didn't come back. And in the morning, AJ called me freaking out, and he'd, he'd went into his house and found him, and it was, it was devastating. Things weren't bad when he died. He was, he got a new job, um, he cleaned himself up, and, um, you know, that last night, was it, oh, I'll just do it one last time. I'll never know. I'll never know what that was. My son had actually um, died in a backyard of somebody's house in a shed. And, um, and I think he was gone for most of the day before anybody noticed that he was gone. Uh, my mom passed away uh, suddenly uh, from an accidental fentanyl overdose. And 129 days later, my little brother Matthew passed away from a meth fentanyl overdose. 146 people um, are affected by one um, tragic death. Uh, and we're also looking, you know, affecting three to four generations with what's happening right now. The grandparents who are raising children because father and mother have died of this overdose. Um, we have, we have fentanyl babies coming into the world now. We don't know what that's going to look like in the future, what the, um, what the care will be, what the cost will be. It's, everything has changed. The world has changed. We need to, as workers and community, need to adjust to that shift. That shift is not going to change. I don't believe it. I think we have to do the change. I think a lot of us appreciate on an intellectual level that other human beings and their families and their social circles are being impacted by this. Um, but it wasn't until that was really personalized for me um, that I think it took hold. Um, since then, uh, after the municipal election, we made a conscious effort for the city of Grand Prairie to take a more direct role in coordinating opioid response in our community. Our community in itself, even in the last two years for sure, but immensely in the last year and a half, has totally um, just skyrocketed forward in its knowledge and um, just understanding. It still has a long ways to go, but at least it's made some traction down the road of, of understanding. International Overdose Awareness Day here in Grand Prairie. It's, it was only our second annual, but it's been going on for a long time. Started in Australia, I believe, because that's the one the one time where we have a variety of people uh, speak out. Mothers um, who've lost children, parents who uh, have children struggling, young adults who are in recovery, adults who are in recovery telling their story so people can really um, come and listen 
and um, understand more, show support. We have to continue to talk openly about the impacts of this on our community. If any time that we think it's okay to shovel this stuff under the rug, we're just paving the way for more kids to die and uh, for more dads to leave their families. I think for a long time, um, it was definitely more stigmatized to street engaged populations. Uh, now we know that that is absolutely not the case, right? Every type of person is being is being affected by opioid addiction. You never know what somebody's going through, right? You never know by looking at them that their sister, their dad, their brother um, might be experiencing a substance use disorder. A lot of the clients that I see come to me to learn how to manage their emotions again because the drugs, the opiates in particular that they've been using, have been doing that for them. And so it represses the emotions that they haven't learned how to deal with. So when I was sexually abused as a young girl multiple times, I didn't know how to voice that. I wasn't taught that. So if I'm not taught that, how do I, I continue on the rest of my life with that? It wasn't really until recovery that I started realizing that there was things that I'd gone through and shit that I hadn't dealt with that I was trying to fill a void because I wasn't happy with myself. I was trying to use drugs as to make me happy. I would say a very large percentage of our clientele, it's trauma for sure. Uh, but then I also have people that that abuse just because that it was their, it was the next drug to try. And so they tried it and liked it and kept going. We're a family. We uh, care about each other, those that we work with. We want to have people uh, living good lives. And so our role, I think, is to offer programs where, where possible to, to help those with substance abuse uh, overcome those issues. We have an Alcoholics Anonymous program in, in, our, in our company where we provide AA, uh, the opportunity for AA meetings in our camp on a weekly basis where people can come, feel trust that there's uh, just an opportunity for them to uh, get the support of the program, the 12-step AA program, uh, without fear of the company uh, being aware of it even. It, it is anonymous and they can go uh, trusting that uh, we just want, uh, want the support for them. The business community is an interesting aspect to this because I, I think often this is viewed as a social uh, cause or a law and order issue and businesses may not see a direct connection for themselves. But the truth is, uh, first off, that businesses are made up of human beings uh, and human beings are vulnerable. Uh, and that in itself should be enough justification for a business to become involved. From many different fields, um, it has been proven time and again that a dollar of prevention you know, equals many dollars of response. I am an expensive and inefficient answer to any social problem you have. 99% of who I deal with will eventually be re-released into society. If, as a society, we do not take steps to assist those persons in whatever got them into conflict with the law in the first place, then odds are they're going to get back into conflict with the law. Harm reduction is essentially a public health approach that meets people where they're at. What it basically does is remove judgmental approaches. Um, we support people regardless of their life circumstances. So they can be homeless, they can be using drugs, they can be um, none of the above. Um, we just kind of, we bring them in, we talk to them, we accept them, we don't judge them, we don't judge their behavior. Uh, in the efforts to make relationships um, so we can increase we can increase their health outcomes and address the social determinants of health. For us, harm reduction is trying to help people to use less, trying to help people to use it in ways that are less invasive even. We call it success when somebody switches from needles to smoking because that's less invasive and they're less likely to pick up things. I don't think people realize where people who use drugs are at when they pick up a dirty needle or when they, you know, inject for the first time over smoking. I don't feel like they think that they have a choice. It's the, in any way that we can keep them a little bit safer, that's what we're trying to do. Whether or not a supervised consum consumption site exists or a mobile unit exists in Grand Prairie, the consumption and the drug use happens. And so when people are left to their own devices, uh, using drugs in a back alley, alone, where if they overdose there will be no help available, uh, it does increase the likelihood that things are going to go sideways.
It's not just about giving drugs and people needles and tin foil and cups and things like that so that they can use. It's about safety and how do we protect them. And it also, when they're in these safe consumption sites or we're handing out these supplies it's not we have a conversation with the people and we can pull information out and maybe that one comment we make might spark something in them and maybe they'll come back three or four more times for supplies but maybe they'll start talking more and then maybe they'll ask for help this is a public health approach um, and it's recognized it's evidence-based it's it's been heavily researched um, throughout Europe and throughout North America for quite a long time. So I generally generally point to the evidence that harm reduction does work and harm reduction is a piece of the pie. It's not the absolute be all of um, substance use supports, but it's it's one small piece of it. Um, traditionally nurses and, and uh, health providers dealt with uh, you know more of uh, the harm reduction stuff. Whereas police, they, they mostly dealt with the enforcement side of things, maybe a little bit of harm reduction. And on our team, we we're able to encompass both. We're, we're a partnership between uh, the RCMP and uh, Alberta Health Services. Essentially, we are a partner of an RCMP member, such as myself, and a registered psychiatric nurse uh, that's supplied by Alberta Health Services. And our function is to respond to mental health and addictions related events. If you look at cities or, or communities of similar size, they'll tell you they don't have a PAC team, they don't have this resource, and even in most of Canada, they don't have something like this. So um, yes, I'm a little bit biased because I'm very passionate about what I, what I do, but I'm also, you know, I do recognize that it is unique. My community gives me hope. Us sticking together as a community uh, and fighting for what we believe in gives me hope. We're lucky here because Grand Prairie is small that basically if you're if you're in this world you kind of do know everyone and so it makes it easier to make connections, it makes it easier to help people. Working on recovery is you know getting the physical piece under control and so you have balance there and then taking on the mental and the emotional and there's no you know like oh you know, I'm on a diet, I'm going to take Mondays or my cheat day. It, it, it's not that kind of a scenario by any stretch. It's literally black and white, life or death, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365. They can call 811, they can call us, they can call the Northern Addiction Centre. Anybody can call at any time and just say like, I need support, I don't know what I'm going, I don't know what's happening. And we've had quite a few parents come in and just talk about naloxone and talk about um, substance use with their children. Alberta Health Services is an incredible, is an incredible program. Um, their Monday night family support, family and friend support group, ACT Medical Clinic as well, St. Lawrence Centre, Rotary House, any of those places, like yeah, we're dealing with people in street engaged populations, but at the end of the day, we're there to support anybody and we can point you in the right direction. Nobody is going to get clean unless they want to, but uh, if they want to, it's lucky that there's programs like the Opiate Dependency Program because it's, it's not an easy task to get clean. I was ready to give up again until HIV see me one day and they asked me to give it a try one more time, so I did, and just this time I got more support, and Sue and Kathy, they stuck by me, and they made me who I am today. I would say if you love someone that's in addiction, go to Friends and Family. It's a Monday night group, meets every Monday night at Northern Addiction Center, 6.15 to 8.15, and it really saved me. It really taught me so much and connected me with other people that were going through what I was going through. The most important thing is uh, having people feel that they're loved. Be comfortable in the idea that you're not alone. You smother them with love. You tell them again and again and you hug them as often as you can. And she said that's her advice to anybody. Do not let go of your values that your family taught you. To remain healthy is to do the work they need to do and to not be afraid to reach out to do that. So now I'm taking the opportunity to work on myself and try to get myself better before I can actually help anybody else. Love, compassion, family, never give up. 
you are somebody, someone, you know what I mean? Like you, you are a person. I think deep down inside, if you really know them or you knew them, you still see that in some way and you hold on to that. You hold on to that hope that they're gonna get better. When I had everything that society looked at as being a wonderful person, matching its expectations and the image, you know, that I, in my perception, I thought was as good as could be, all that was broken. And I got opened up to the beauty of human connection and true intimacy. I've done a lot of hard things in my life, but talking about my feelings was probably one of the hardest. Um, I go through moments of peace, which is mostly an, uh, a daily occurrence now, where I have these shots and I feel the earth and I feel the people around me. And there's nothing more powerful than human connection. To me, That's the only reason I'm alive today.